Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Fear and Trembling, and indeed in many of his other works, Søren Kierkegaard is going to talk about faith as a passion. And this may put off a lot of readers at the very beginning because they have a different conception of faith where it's something much more about propositions that one assents to. Uh, having faith and not having knowledge in certain things being the case. They may also be a bit put off as philosophers because there tends to be a considerable distrust of resting anything on the basis of the passions or emotions or drives or anything affective on the part of philosophical discussion, exposition, argument. Why? Because it's felt that that's far too subjective. That if I don't have the same feeling or emotion or desire, I won't be able to relate to it. It won't be universally valid and objective. And, and Kierkegaard can say, yes, there is that aspect over here, but what I'm concerned with over here requires that I think of things in terms of the passions and in terms of faith as the highest passion of a human being. At one point in the work, Kierkegaard does say that when it comes to, for example, arguments for the existence of God or how we ought to live, we really cannot do without some sort of, we might call it, passional basis. That if we want to have any sort of genuine conviction, we do need the passions. So faith, as Kierkegaard is describing it, is... Uh, besides being a comportment, besides being an idea, besides being all sorts of other things, it is a passion. So we ought to think first about, well, what is a passion? It's often used as a sort of synonym for emotion or feeling. And there is a wide range. Some authors like to make a distinction between different kinds of emotional or affective states that would have passions on one side and feelings on another, maybe moods over here. But Kierkegaard is not doing that so much, although we're going to see him distinguishing faith from other emotions or passions. But a passion is some sort of emotional state. Does that mean that it's purely emotion, that it doesn't involve any cognition, that it doesn't have any cognitive or propositional or judgment aspects to it? That's not the case. And faith uh, is a prime example of this. The person who actually has faith or lives within it is going to believe all sorts of things and act on the basis of those beliefs. It is going to carry out some reasoning processes that are informed by or oriented or even encouraged, you might say, and sustained by that very emotion of faith. And orientation is another thing that we can talk about. What it means to have faith is to be oriented towards some things and away from others and to be oriented towards something higher than oneself that in some way one relates to or participates in. So that's another important idea. Faith also involves some sort of action comportment. Uh, there's that old, you know, phrase coming from one of the, the letters that, you know, faith without works is, is dead. And indeed, although Kierkegaard is a Lutheran and, and, you know, there's that whole justification by faith thing, Kierkegaard thinks that works, in fact, matter. That if you do have faith, you're going to do things. It's going to express itself in that way. And we might also think about responses as well. Not just action, but taking things on 
And some people could talk about passion as drive when we say follow your passion, right? If Kierkegaard is right, following the passion of faith would in fact be quite good for you. Not every passion is something that you should follow. If your passion is of doing something terrible, uh, because you know your passion is, say, infinite revenge on humanity for having brought you into this world, maybe don't follow that passion. But this passion you could follow. And all of these conceptions, all of these realities, emotional state, cognition, orientation, action, all of these are involved in what goes into a passion. So you want to keep that in the back of your mind as you're reading this work and thinking about what Kierkegaard is actually saying here. Another thing that's quite important that he brings up at the very end in the epilogue, he tells us the essentially human is passion. Now that's something worth dwelling on for a moment because what have philosophers said the essentially human is in the past? Reason. But just as essentially human is the fact that we feel and what it is that we feel towards and the fact that our feelings can be very low, ones that we share with animals, and the most sublime. So why does he tell us this? The sentence continues, in which one generation perfectly understands another and understands itself. For example, no generation has learned to love from another. No generation is able to begin at any other point than the beginning. No later generation has a more abridged task. And if someone desires to go further and not stop with loving as the previous generation did, then this is foolish and idle talk. We can, in fact, relate to people in previous generations, in generations to come, in other cultures, uh, in, you know, the, the distant past, on the basis of our passions. It's not perfect. There's no coincidence. As a matter of fact, we often misunderstand each other while we're feeling our emotions in relation to each other. This is where many disputes and fights and long uh, simmering conflicts come from when people think the other person or feel the other person is feeling something uh, that perhaps they're not or they're not entirely or not for the same reason and then they respond uh, on that basis and the other person of course because they're not entirely passive is doing something similar in response and you can mix other people into this as well and cultural assumptions and we could go on and on but emotion does offer us or passion does offer us a way in which we can bridge those gaps and come to understand each other. He goes on and tells us that the highest passion in a person is faith and no generation begins at any point than where the previous generation did. Earlier on, he talks about the dialectical struggles of faith and its gigantic passion. So he, he's progressively moving from a gigantic passion early on in the work to one of the higher passions to the highest passion. Let's talk now about the distinction that he's making here. So he tells us that faith is no aesthetic emotion. What would be an aesthetic emotion? Something that is just responding to the world that we exist in. Uh, we, you know, aesthetics is about sensation. So if I feel a certain desire to have coffee and then I feel pleasure in drinking the coffee or annoyance because it's, it's gotten cold and the milk has congealed or any other thing like that, that would be an aesthetic emotion. He tells us, Faith is no aesthetic emotion, but something far higher. He says it's not the spontaneous inclination of the heart, it's not an automatic response, but the paradox of existence. So in faith, in this emotion, in this passion, we wind up relating ourselves to something that is fundamental, the paradox of existence. The, the way in which we experience things as beings who go beyond the merely aesthetic, our environment, and participate in something of the eternal, the infinite, and then compare that back to the world that we live in, often saying in the process, what the hell? Now, 
A little bit later than that, Kierkegaard says that what the knight of faith, the person who is living this out, does is to exist in such a, a way that my contrast to existence constantly expresses itself as the most beautiful and secure harmony with it. That's a cognitive way of expressing what it is that faith feels or faith drives us towards as a passion. It requires, as Kierkegaard tells us, in order for this to be the case, a movement antecedent to it of infinite resignation, which is a movement of both the will, but also of the passions. So there is a previous passional commitment of infinite resignation that takes place prior to faith. And this can happen in many different ways. He tells us that, for example, for Socrates, his confession of ignorance was his infinite resignation. For other people, it will be other things. In Abraham's case, uh, we have to imagine that the infinite resignation was of trying to make sense of what God was commanding him to do and, and saying, oh, this doesn't really make sense, but I'll, I'll, I guess I have to go along with it. And then he goes beyond that into faith. And a little bit later, Kierkegaard tells us, uh, again, by contrast, that um, faith is not within the commonplace company of feelings, moods, idiosyncrasies, vapors. Uh, if, if that was the case, then you know, philosophy is right in saying that we should stop with faith. Instead, think of it as a, a passion that precisely because it is the highest passion and does have to do with all of existence, including my own place in it and my relation to whatever it is that transcends or exceeds me, goes far beyond the, the realm of lower emotions, but could transform and incorporate them. This is where we need to talk about something else. What other passions or emotional states or affective responses are involved with faith? There's three that Kierkegaard constantly comes back to in this work. And you should see them not at just as something distinct from faith, but something that faith as the emotion that he's talking about incorporates. And that might throw you for a bit of a loop in saying, well, wait a second, one emotion or passion cannot incorporate another emotion or passion. And I'll give you a great counterexample. Think about anger, right? Aristotle tells us that, that anger includes pain, which is an emotion, pain or sorrow at being hurt, insulted, something like that. It also includes a desire, desire for retribution or setting things right. It also includes hope, which is the pleasant aspect to anger, the hope of being able to impose that. So if anger, which is a lower emotion, can be complex enough to incorporate other emotional states within it, why could not faith? Faith does for Kierkegaard. It includes anxiety. And this is where you can see that for, for Kierkegaard, faith is something very, very different than just turning your brain off and believing blindly in something. It incorporates anxiety about the very object that one is having faith in, that there will be a good resolution, that God will fulfill his promises, whatever it happens to be. Love is another key emotion involved in there as well. And then he talks over and over again about a kind of courage that the knight of faith is able to have, which he himself, as the author, confesses himself unable to exhibit, although he can certainly understand it and admire it. What about other things that he talks about that faith is not going to be connected with? He talks about irony and humor at one point and says that these are also passions, passions that characterize his own age, but they are reflective passions. They are passions that fall within the realm of infinite resignation, not within faith. So the person who has faith, who is exhibiting faith, is not being ironic, is, is not you know, just engaging in humor. Not to say that they couldn't also do that, but that's not integral to faith. Pain. When you go through the infinite resignation, there is a pain or sorrow 
or sadness involved in it. But for faith, instead we're going to see joy as being the counterpart to that. Finally, Kierkegaard also talks about the horror of existence that people can feel. He is not somebody who has a, you know, sort of Pollyannish view on the nature of the world. It is a tough place to live. And it's not fair. And many things go wrong. And there aren't rational explanations for why things are the way that they are that truly satisfy us. And so one can have this sort of horror that he talks about. That's not going to be part of faith. But he does talk about it in here, as well as other emotions as well. So hopefully, now when you return to this work, it makes a bit more sense. All these references to faith as a passion. All of these ideas are rolled into that. You have to understand it not just as a mere basic emotional response, but as the highest possible emotion or passion for a person, motivating their entire being, incorporating so much else, making some sort of sense out of themselves, the universe, and their relation to the divine.